Hey, as we begin, I would just love to give God a bit of praise for all the new brothers and sisters that have been baptized and restored in this past week. It's been awesome. If you uh, can, maybe you could drop some claps in the chat. Um, not for the work of man, but honestly for the work of God. Uh, I'm so encouraged, that, and I'm really, I've been blown away at the way in which God's kingdom had been moving in such a difficult time. Uh, so many of you have been focused in on the mission. You've been reaching more people. You've been uh, sharing these messages, and others have contacted us about trying to study the Bible and get connected. And um, your, your boldness and your courage and your willingness to share has really done some great things for God and his kingdom. And so you have an opportunity again. I know Andrew's already given you an opportunity to share, but this is another great opportunity to do that. You can just uh, share this on all your social media feeds or uh, you can comment on the sermon or just hit the like button a bunch of times or the love button. And uh, those things really do uh, push the message um, that we have from God forward. Um, amen. I'm so, so grateful for you as a church and I'm grateful that we get to partner in this in this really bizarre time. As Andrew mentioned, we're in week two of a series that we're calling Have Mercy. If you weren't with us last week, let me catch you up. Uh, We talked about the biblical principle of overlooking an offense, that offenses are things that are just trying to sort of drown us into a pool of our own despair. Uh, They weigh us down, they take us off course. And the heart of God is that we would be people that have the faith not to just disregard the offense or to push it aside or sweep it under the rug, but instead that we would have the faith to rise above it. Because as we said last week, Satan wants to make you bitter, bring you low by making you bitter. But God's purpose for you is to rise above it. That was last week. And let me tell you what we're going to talk about this week. Um, And let me just warn you, this week is going to be a little bit heavy. But I believe that on the other side of difficult, we often find what is best. And on the other side of hardship, we find freedom. And I want to warn you as we start, the sermon today uh, may feel a little bit longer um, because the text that we're going to study is really very rich. And I want to handle it carefully so that we can, as a family of believers, can continue to be transformed by the beauty and the depths of God's word. Today, we're going to look at Luke chapter, um, we're going to look at Luke chapter 17. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there with me. Um, and let me start by asking you a question. Who betrayed you? Do you know somebody in your life who's lied to you? Or maybe they lied about you. Someone who took advantage of you, someone who mistreated you, who brought you pain that even today you're dealing with. Did someone in your life betray your confidence? Did they get you fired? Has someone tried to make your life a living hell? Is it an ex-spouse or an ex-partner? an ex-friend, or maybe it's somebody that invested so much in you and then abandoned you along the way. Who lived a double life, broke promises, someone who broke your heart, someone who broke up your family? Was it a child who you poured everything into, who you raised as best as you could, and then they grew up and jumped off the proverbial cliff? Who do you know that changed the lens in which you look at life? Who turned your joy into pain? Was it an employer who was cruel to you, who treated you like trash even though you were loyal to them? They dropped you in a matter of moments even though you had kind of followed them and been loyal to their own cause. Was it a teacher? Was it a mentor who abandoned you? A friend who dishonored you or destroyed you, a partner or a parent who deserted you as you were growing up? Was it an authority figure who molested or maybe stole your purity? Someone with sick and twisted motives who broke you down? Maybe it was someone who you didn't even know, whose face is now burned into the core of your being. Who betrayed you? Who took advantage of you? Who hurt you? smashed your dreams, collapsed your will. And out of just a, um, out of the spirit of transparency, um, this obviously, I'm going to share a story, but this obviously isn't the largest betrayal of my life, but it's the only one I feel really confident sharing in public. It happened when I was young. When I was in third grade, I had a teacher who constantly, throughout the entire third grade year, called me, and I know this word is offensive, but this is what she called me. She called me retarded. Day in and day out, she would call me retarded. She, um, she would bring me up to the class, and she would hang my test scores over my head. She was holding my head, and she would say, this is what stupid looks like. 
I was in third grade. Third grade. I tried to, to, I don't know, laugh with the kids, with the teachers on cruelty, but it burned in my heart. One day it got so bad that I came home and I asked my mom, and my mom recalls this story, I asked her if she could try to find me a class where the teacher likes dumb kids also. It wasn't that I wanted another teacher who wouldn't call me dumb, it's I wanted him to, her to accept that I was dumb. I was in third grade. It turns out I was dyslexic, and so reading and writing were really hard for me, and in some ways they're still hard for me. But that feeling, I mentioned this before, but that feeling of being and feeling stupid is a label I've worn my entire life. It's damaged me. It's caused me a lot of pain. I just, I just wanted to be liked even, liked, even if I was the stupid guy. That's just one of my stories. And you have your story, don't you? You have your story of, or your story about people or systems that try to rob you of joy. We all have them. We have our stories. And if we were just open up the chat and just ask everybody to write their stories down, we would read those stories and we would get mad for you and we would just cry and weep and weep and weep and weep and just be so broken hearted at the things that life had produced in us. Man, so the question is, who, who hurt you? As you think about your own story, and as this question stirs in your mind, let me tell you about what we're studying today. Today, we're looking at Jesus' instruction to his disciples, where, where he gives them the principle of what they are to do when they are hurt. And the way in, he, the way in which he views that feeling of being hurt we're going to look at Luke chapter 17. Again, you can turn there with me, but I want to tell you a little bit about Luke 17. Luke 17 is a place where Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's been teaching them for a couple of chapters, and basically he's trying to tell them about what life is going to be like after he leaves. And so as often is the case, he is teaching them at kind of opposite of what the religious leaders at the time have been teaching. The, the religious leaders at the time had kind of a worldly system they subscribed to. In, in, in the previous chapters, by way of teaching, basically Jesus exposes the religious leaders as purveyors of false doctrines, as inventors of oppressive systems, and he calls them hypocrites. They, because they claimed to be righteous, but they were foul and corrupt, and he calls them whitewashed tombs later in the book of Matthew. They had no interest in the people they were supposed to be serving. They cared mainly for power, position, and prosperity. They, they, were, they had just nothing but contempt and maybe even dis, disdain for the people they were supposed to give their hearts to. And they built this system of oppression that, that spanned the entire um, Jewish religion because it, it, it was manifested through this thing called the synagogue system. Synagogues were in every single village and every single town. It was the hub. And because the religious leaders were in charge of those systems, that or were, were in charge of those um, synagogues, that system of cruelty was allowed to thrive. They ruined people's lives, causing them to stumble. Jesus would say of them in Matthew chapter 23, this whole chapter is about him just um, shouting out, disdain for those people. He says, you shut the doors of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. He's saying you had the power to help, but you don't care. You don't care. You don't care about those people. And so Jesus is trying to instruct his followers, and he's juxtaposing what the Pharisees do with what he wants his people to do. And that's where we are in Luke chapter 17. What we're going to read today is against the grain of the religious system at the time, and I believe it's against the grain of the world in which we live in today. We're going to read it, and then we're going to go back and unpack the text. Let's read it together. This is Luke chapter 17, verse 1 through 5. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their necks than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourself. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. If they sin against you seven times in a day, even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. 
There's so much here that we want to take it piece by piece. Today is going to feel a little bit less like a sermon and more like a Bible study because I noticed that, that I needed to really have a little bit more of a nuanced approach to this subject because it's so challenging. And there really is no pithy statement that I could throw up on the board that could synthesize all that it is that we're going to learn today. I couldn't really do justice with, a tech, with just a, a quick line on the screen, so I really want to walk through it. Today we're going to walk through this text. It might, again, feel like a Bible study and less like a sermon, but this is the type of sermon that I encourage you to pull out a notebook, pull out your notes app on your phone, and maybe even go back and re-listen later on. Let's talk about Jesus' statement to the disciples as we begin, and we'll see the way it enlightens the heart of who God is in the presence of such a difficult time. First thing he says is, Jesus said to the disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. This is an important statement because what he's saying, as we will see very clearly, is that evil is inevitable. Broken people breaking people is all too common. He's helping them understand that they live in a broken world that they will be hurt, that they will be disappointed. He looks at the religious system that had bound men for centuries, and he says, this system will hurt you. This world will destroy you, will betray you. You will be betrayed by people you love, by the powers that be. You will be hurt. There's another version of this text in the New King James that says this, It is impossible that no offense should come. It's impossible. It's inevitable. It will happen. And obviously, if it's true for them, it's also true for us as well. And I don't even have to tell you that. You know that because you live that. Evil is everywhere. The world is evil. So there are evil things every single day, every single second that happen to wonderful people. Children in our country go hungry. Children around the world starve to death. Infanticide is rampant. Racism continuously oppresses people. People are killed by the authorities, and those in authority are killed by those wanting authority. People are lied to, savagely taken advantage of, taken on a ride, chill up. Children face hardship and challenges, and there's suffering everywhere. All, it all happens in the hands of a corrupt system of living, led by the king of all lies, Satan himself. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, very clearly mentions to them that evil is inevitable. That's what's in those words. All of the injurious facets of the human relations, of relations are, are inevitable. He wants you to understand and me to understand that there is going to be wickedness in the world we live in. And just to be totally clear, this does not lessen the seriousness of evil. It's just an acknowledgement of it. And the reason I believe Jesus begins with these words and the reason I believe Jesus begins with this idea as he starts diving into this really difficult subject is because he wants you to know that God sees. That God knows. That he sees what's happening in our world. That he sees it. That every drop of human blood shed at the hands of hateful men is mourned by the heart of our benevolent God. God sees it. We worship a God who knows our pain. We worship a God who sees our suffering, who sees the scars. He knows all the labels we wear. He knows the fears that we, can't, we feel like we can't escape. He knows the anger that's, that's in our hearts towards sinful men. Evil is inevitable, yes, absolutely, but God sees it. And so when Jesus addresses his disciples, he acknowledges it. In Young's literal translation, it says, it is impossible for offense not to come because we live in a world full of sinners and sinful people. Sin is everywhere through everything and lives in every one. And then Jesus continues. But woe to anyone through whom they come. Evil is inevitable, yes. God sees it, yes. But woe 
to anyone through whom it comes. The first statement reveals God's mercy. The second reveals his righteous anger. Woe. We don't have a word like this in the English language. Um, It's an onomatopoeia, which means it's a word that is a sound, basically. Woe is an eerie sound. It's ominous. It's a dreadful noise. Um, One commentator said it's like the cry of an eagle. That's the way it sounds, like, ah! I don't know how to do that, but you get the sense. And that's that's what's expressed in this cry. It's a cry of distress. It's a cry of horror. Jesus used woe frequently, primarily talking about the religious leaders, but he also used it to talk about the cities that were unrepentant. It's kind of like an explosion of anger. Woe! It's supposed to leave you startled when you hear that word. Whoa! It's supposed to go, there is dread coming on the next, in the next sentence. So in this context, what you have here is that evil is inevitable, that God sees it, but woe to anyone through whom it comes. Okay, sure, sorrow is going to happen, but it would be better that you, or, you, or rather, it would, you better not be the one who brings the sorrow. Sorrow is inevitable, yes, but you better not be the one who brings it. Then Jesus explains how dreadful it would be for you to be the person that brings the offense. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. These little ones is a term used to talk about the people of God. Let me tell you about a millstone. A millstone, a great millstone, would have been a a stone that was about four or five feet wide, about a foot thick, and would weigh about a thousand pounds. So he's saying, don't you dare be the source of a child of God's hardship, because it would be worse for you than if you were dying a torturous death. In fact, it would be better for you to get a a stone tied around your neck, thrown at the bottom of the sea where you're trying desperately to get up and you die this terrible torture. It would be better for you to die that way than to try or than to cause hardship on one of God's chosen people. That's the spirit. It would be better for you to die a mafia-style death. He's not saying that's the penalty. He's saying it would be better for you to die. The fate is worse than death. That's the point. Why? Because death is but a moment. But after death then comes judgment. And judgment is eternal. Eternal judgment will be the result of anyone who causes a child of God to suffer. And here's why this is important for us to understand. Because knowing knowing what God will do enables us to have confidence in what we should do. Knowing what God will do enables us to have confidence in what we should do. So yes, evil is inevitable. But God sees it, and God will judge. He will judge wrongdoing. It will happen. God is going to bring judgment on the unrepentant. It will happen. He will bring judgment on those who brutalize, those who oppress, those who mistreat. He will bring judgment on the selfishly rich who hoard all their money and disregard the poor. He will judge those who are racist, who treat members of other races as though they're beneath them and banish them into a realm of of obscurity. He will handle the sicknesses of of sin that trap people in a lifelong um, path of drug use and abuse. He will deal with it. He is not blind to the nature of our world. He knows what's happening. God sees it. God sees every day children being murdered in their mother's womb. God sees vile men taking advantage of young women in the sex trade. He sees the pipeline of mass incarceration. He sees a hungry world. He sees it, and the point is he's doing something about it. Every unrepentant system, every unrepentant person that harms the people of God will be exposed and then brought to judgment by a living, eternal, all-powerful King of Kings. And the point is that I'm just trying to say that God hasn't forgotten your hardship. God hasn't abandoned you during your hardship. He's going to take care of it. It might not come in the way you want, 
or in the speed you want, but he will break every, everything that bounds you to a system of oppression. Nahum chapter 1, Jesus spe- or, uh, um, the apostle Nahum speaking to the people of Israel when they're in captivity in Assyria, he says, Now I will break the yoke of bondage from your neck and tear off the chains of the Assyrian oppression. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 through 9, it says, How awful that day will be to others. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. In that day, it says, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yokes off their neck and tear off their bounds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. The point is that God is doing something. And you need to know that, that when it's time, it will end. All of it will end. I'm not saying that right now you shouldn't fight for it. Sure, you should fight for it. But let's try to to be a part of the solution. Let's try to bring heaven here on earth. But what I'm trying to say is the Calvary is coming. And those who are with us are much more than those who are with them. And our, the, those who are in our, pow, are our, in our company are much stronger than those who are in their company. The greatest militia ever to come is going to come by way of the King of Kings. He's coming on the cloud with fire and with wrath and with judgment. And the picture is like this. With one hand, he holds back his fury. He holds it all back. And with the other hand, he extends mercy. He's trying to plead with a lost world to come back to repentance. With one hand, he holds it back. With other hand, he extends it. And one day, both hands will be dropped. The mercy will no longer be offered. And the wrath will no longer be held back. God is coming. And when he does, he will restore everything. No wrath will be held back and no mercy will will be given. God is doing something. Evil is inevitable, but God sees. God will judge. Just to add something, you better not be the person who is deserving of judgment. You better not be the person who's putting stumbling blocks in your brother or sister's path. So you might ask how you can do that, and I'm just going to take a quick aside. There's two ways to do it, and this is coming from the pattern of the Pharisees. One, you can be a false teacher. You can add or take things from the gospel message, acting like a teacher of scripture when you don't really know what you're talking about. And in that way, you can crush people by teaching them they need to learn this other text in order to really be satisfied in Christ. They need to read these other things in order to really know what Christianity means. Or you can take things away. Don't really worry about that. You don't have to worry about that situation. You can do that. And in that way, you would be deserving of wrath. Or you could be a false Christian. You could be a hypocrite. And your words can be wonderful, but you can live a life of immorality or greed or political idolatry. And other people will look at you and say, wow, you're a wonderful Christian from their viewpoint, but you'll be like those people that Jesus said, I, I, didn't I drive out demons in your name? And didn't I do all these things in your name? And Jesus will look at them and say, I never knew you. So if you're one of those two people, and maybe you don't know, maybe you need to get some help, but I encourage you to repent. Repent. So evil is inevitable. God sees and God will judge. And that's, what set, that's the setup. That's the context, just before we hear the heart of this discussion about forgiveness. Why? Because again, knowing what God will do enables us to have confidence in what we should do. See, if God is the judge, that means that you're not the judge. If God is the one that brings the wrath, it means you don't have to be the one that brings the wrath. You learn what your role is if you understand what God's role will be at the end. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. So there's evil in the world perpetuated by evil people and evil systems, and God will judge them. 
but, but knowing that God will judge them uh, enables you to practice this idea of rebuking and forgiving. In the vernacular of this series, we're going to call it giving corrections and having mercy. So because you understand all that it is that God is doing, you understand that God sees that he will judge, you, you can now have confidence in doing what you're supposed to do, which is giving corrections and having mercy. Believers do not give offenses. They do not take offense either. Disciples of Jesus do not sin against others, nor do they hold a grudge when people sin against them. We don't lead people into sin. What we do is we lead them out of it. And we do this in two parts, correction and forgiveness, or rebuking and, and forgiving. Um, if this is the principle, it's, it's found in, in Luke 17, we looked at it, but the principle is explained in more detail in Matthew chapter 18. We don't have a lot of time to read this or, or walk through this, but I want to just tell you uh, snippets of it. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, we're given the process of what rebuking and correcting is supposed to look like. It, it's in order to bring people to repentance, but it plays out in detail. Matthew 18 says that if your brother sins against you, you are to go to them. Your brother or sister, you are to go directly to them. You go, hey, bro, hey, sis, I, I want to help you with the sin because you, you did wrong to me. If they repent, you won them over and you let it go. If they don't repent, you take two or three witnesses with you the next time. Why do you take two or three witnesses? Because one, they need to clarify that you've actually been sinned against. And two, they need to clarify that that person has actually been unrepentant. So they're just, you're, they're kind of arbitrators of a, of a, of a discussion. Ar arbitrators? Arbitrators of a discussion. So... So um, that's what, what happens. You bring the people, and they go with you, you have this discussion, and hopefully they repent. If they still don't repent, you bring them in front of the entire church with hopes that that process will then draw them back. If they don't listen to the church, you have nothing to do with them. Those details are written and laid out in Matthew chapter 18. You can go back and read that on your own, but that's the principle that's found in this text that we're looking at in, in Luke chapter 17, verse 3. We, we don't have time to walk through it and how that all works, but, but suffice it to say, the Bible teaches us that some forgiveness is conditional. And that's important to know, that some forgiveness is conditional. And I want to tell you what type of sins are listed in Matthew chapter 18 and in Luke chapter 17, because these things are all really important. Matthew 18 and Luke 17 are talking about sins that are of a regular um, lifestyle. You know, they, they just continue to do it that way. The reason we know that is because of two things. One is because of the way that he says, even if they do it seven times. So there's a sense where it's continuous. Someone does it again and again and again and again. And the other reason we know that it's a, a type of sin that's about recurring is because if it wasn't, we would live in a crazy world where every time anybody does anything, it's like we have to, have, we have to bring them up before the church and have this long discussion. It would just be way too much. So common sense tells us, but also the text tells us that this is about recurring action. But the question comes then, is there any other way that you're supposed to handle sin? Do you ever just forgive? And, and I want to tell you that, that in fact there are times when you are supposed to forgive unconditionally. This text says if they repent, you forgive. But there's other times when you're supposed to forgive unconditionally. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 8 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. Love should blanket over a lot of sins. There are sins that should just hide because of how much we love people. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, we read this last week. Love covers all, wrong, uh, all wrongs. Um, the New American Standard Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Now, there are some sins that just need to be forgiven. The reason we know this is because in Psalm chapter 32, verse 1, it says, blessed is, the, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And so covering equals forgiveness. Those are parallel statements. And so there are times when you just cover over a sin. You just let it go. You go, it's okay. You know, it's been wrong. I've been wronged, but I'm going to let it go. But if it becomes a recurring sin, then you begin to deal with it. There's another illustration in Mark chapter 11, verse 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, the Bible says, forgive them. So your Father in heaven may forgive you also. There's no conditions in this text. It doesn't say go grab them. It doesn't say go run over and have a discussion. You just forgive them. 
And so the question may come, how do we know if I, how do we know if I'm supposed to forgive in a moment or if I'm supposed to correct? And here is my opinion. Here's the way I try to go about it in my own life. This isn't necessarily what the Bible teaches uh, verbatim, but this is my perspective on the text. I believe that we should always be humble in correction and urgent in forgiveness. Humble in correction and urgent in forgiveness. We should just always follow that system. If someone sins against you, you can be humble in your correction. Hey, bro, I noticed that you said this thing. You probably didn't mean it, but I wanted to ask you about it. And if they come back and they say, actually, I did mean it, then you go, okay, wonderful. This is a process where I need to go find some people to rebuke you. But if they go, you know what, you're right, I didn't mean that at all, then amen. Then you're urgent in forgiveness. Hey, I just want to say, yeah, we're good. You want to be humble in correction and urgent in forgiveness. I don't want to sit in judgment. And I also don't want to sweep things under the rug. I want to be humble in correction and urgent in forgiveness. So here's a quick review. Evil is inevitable. God sees it. God will judge. And that gives us the confidence to be humble in correction and urgent in forgiveness. And then if you're saying, okay, but how many times? You know, those people, but they keep wronging me. They keep hurting me. They've been brutal to me. They've been evil to me. They've been vile to me. How many times should I forgive? Well, then Jesus says this, even if they sin against you seven times in a day, which I bet the apostles are thinking, no, maybe one time in a day, seven times in a lifetime. But seven times in a day sounds like way too much. Seven times, even if they come back and go, I repent, you must forgive them. This number doesn't refer to the quantity of forgiveness. It refers to the quality of forgiveness. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion, which means it's over. I forgive. It's finished. It's gone. And then on hearing this, this is what the disciples say. Lord, increase our faith. I can't do this. When I look back at my stories, when I look at all the people who have brought me down, when I look at all the situations that scarred me, comments that were said or things that were done to me that leave an etching on my heart that hurt me, that stole my own purity. When I think about all of that, the only response is the same response the apostles give. God, I don't think I can do this. Would you increase my faith? Would you increase my faith? Could you put that in the chat? Increase my faith. Increase my faith. What Jesus demands in this context seems to be an impossible standard to live up to. It seems to be an impossible thing to follow. How could you possibly forgive some of the things that people have done? How could you possibly forgive some of the crazy wickedness this world has produced? How could you possibly forgive? Lord, would you increase my faith. Look, forgiveness will never seem fair. It will never seem fair. As a matter of fact, there's nothing about forgiveness that is fair. It's not fair. It's also not natural. It's fair to pay people back. You hit me, it's fair for me to bust your lip. It's fair for me, you hurt my child, it's fair that I get a chance to do something to you. It's fair for me to be evil. It's fair for evil to respond with evil. That's what's fair in the world. And sometimes I'm thinking about the evil of the world and I'm just thinking about all the terrible things that are going on in our society. I'm thinking about all the people that have been hurt and I'm just laying in my bed and I'm just saying, God, would you be fair for a moment? And then I stop and I remember that I don't want fairness. Because fairness says that I deserve death. That's what fairness says. Fairness says that the wage of my sin is the grave. That's what fairness says. I don't want, I don't want fairness. What I want is I want mercy. I want mercy. I want mercy 
from God, and so here's the thought, right? If I want mercy from God, shouldn't I want mercy for others? Shouldn't I long that others would get mercy too? If I want mercy from God, shouldn't I lay in my bed thinking about the evil of the world and just going, God, could your kindness allow someone to be brought to repentance? Lord, could your mercy allow some systems to be broken? God, could your love produced by the disciples living their best life, would you please just stir someone's heart so that they would repent of their sins? God, I don't want fairness. What I want is mercy. In some ways, right, the idea is that forgiveness is just giving others what God gave us in Christ. That's all it really is. With an understanding that God will judge the world with an understanding that God will handle sin, with an understanding that, yes, I need to continue to be an advocate, with the understanding, with all those understandings, at the same time we sit back and we go, look, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to correct, but I'm going to forgive because that is what I was given in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is not easy. It's easy to be bitter. It's easy to get revenge. It's easy to be angry. It's easy, but it's hard to decide, you know what? I forgive. Lord, increase our faith. Even as I say this to you right now, I'm not even sure if I believe I can do it. Lord, today would you increase our faith, God? Would you increase our faith? Faith enables me to see an opportunity for freedom in my own life where there only seems like offenses. And I'm just saying, as we end this discussion here, let's just remember, the world is evil. But God sees it. He will bring judgment on the unrepentant. And that gives me the confidence to correct, as stated in Matthew 18, and follow that protocol, but also to, to be okay with forgiving to be urgent in forgiveness. And so instead of going, ah, they deserve mercy, I started, or they deserve death, what I started to ask myself is not, not how much forgiveness do they deserve, but instead, how much freedom do I desire? Because if I can learn to forgive, I can find great freedom. Not how much forgiveness do they deserve, because they don't deserve forgiveness, you don't deserve forgiveness, no one deserves forgiveness, but instead, how much freedom to live in Christ do I desire. Church, I love you. I know this time has been hard, but I want to urgently encourage you. I want to encourage you to learn to be humble in your corrections, but also to be urgent in your forgiveness. Let's go to God in prayer for our communion time. Father, we love you. Um, we cherish being in a relationship with you. We thank you, God, that you look at our hardship and you know, you know what we're going through. It's, it's even more um, profound for me because you know what we're going through exactly. Like you, you, you watched it happen. You saw it happen and yet you can still speak into our life and ask us to have mercy on people. Lord, if you know us and you know that we're able to do it, I pray that you would increase our faith so that we really can do it. God, today, would you increase our faith as a congregation? Would you increase our faith to be humble in the way we correct people? Would you increase our faith to believe that you will handle un unjust situations? God, would you increase our faith to, to believe that, that forgiveness actually does produce freedom in our own hearts? Would you increase our faith to, to let go of the things that we're harboring in our heart towards our own brothers and sisters? Lord, would you allow us today to just let go of those things, to give them up to you, Lord, or to, to deal with the correction that we're supposed to, but then to give it up, God? Lord, I know that as you hung on the cross on Calvary, Lord, you made a statement that is just so hard to fathom. You look at the people who had hung you on the tree, and you said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Even in a moment of, your, of the worst suffering in human existence, you were able to look at a crowd and offer them mercy. God, would you allow us to do that to others as well?
Jesus, we thank you for the death that you gave us, and your, rather the life that you gave us, and the death that you provided for us as a gateway to have eternal life. Thank you that you are our King, and thank you that you are our Savior. We cherish you. We thank you for the bread that represents your body and the juice that represents your blood. Lord, let us do this in remembrance of you. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Please like, comment, and subscribe. We are so excited about all that God is doing right here in Broward County, Florida.